James 5, 13 through 20. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Is, let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brethren, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So today I have to try something new um, in our effort to keep the internet from crashing. I turned off my printer before I had uh, actually printed my sermon. So today I will be print <laughs> preaching from an iPad. So you will get to see the warm glow of God's goodness upon my face today. So you see today's, uh, the title of today's sermon, No Religion but social religion. So in 1739, John Wesley coined the terms social religion and social holiness. Much like our, much like reading the Bible today, certain things come to mind based on, based on our own context, right? Based on your context and my context, certain things come to mind. Listen to John Wesley's words and think about what comes to mind. Uh, just kind of imagine his thoughts. He says this, the gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Now, I would imagine, maybe I'm wrong and that's fine, but I would imagine that based on our current uses of the word social, what comes to mind is something on the lines of social justice, right? Is that the first thing you hear? Because when I hear it, that's the first thing that I hear, uh, social justice. And when I say the word social justice, all sorts of connotations come to mind, some positive and some negative. Let's, let's just be honest. For some people, it's very important. Some people, it's like, oh, stop. Either way, it doesn't matter. And as you would imagine, plenty of churches have used Wesley's terms of social religion and social holiness to mean just that, that our religion must be completely based on social justice as we know the term to be. But here's the thing, and I'm not gonna, I don't wanna, I'm not addressing social justice in any way this morning. Looking at just at those words from something that Wesley wrote 300 years ago, 1739 is when he coins the phrase social religion and social holiness. It's no different than taking our favorite verse of scripture out of its context and applying it to make it work for our very own ends. And it's just, there's no different of taking, pulling things out of context and saying, well, this is what this means. But Wesley had something very, very different in mind when he coined the phrases social religion and social holiness. Wesley's really big on holiness throughout his writing. In fact, the terms come from the preface of a volume of hymns and poems that he had written for his gathered group. So Wesley had created within the Anglican Church, because Wesley was an Anglican preacher, he had created this system of what you and I would know today as small groups, called them classes, and, and they had all sorts of other names as it kind of went up bigger and and i can't recall them right now and i think my methodism professor was probably very angry with me 
but I can't, but, 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 but the smallest group was a class. And so it'd be like four or five individuals and they would gather together once or twice a week. They'd pray, they'd sing, they just counted on one another. And so it's this quote, it comes from a, a, a volume of hymns and poems that was written for them. He uses the preface to actually attack those that were advocating some kind of religion or holiness that could be achieved in isolation. Like a desert monk who separates his or herself from everyone and everything, supposing that it would make them more holy. If I just got away from everyone and everything and never saw another person again, that would make me more holy. And that was kind of what Wesley was, was talking about. So now let me give you kind of the full quote and its connotation so now you understand what Wesley was saying. This is him in context. Solitary religion is not to be found in the gospel of Christ. Ooh. It's, it's a little harsh here. Holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. That's strong. I mean, that's like Wesley. If you go back and read Wesley, he pulls no punches. And, and, and really, he's, well, that's just John Wesley. The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Now do you understand where, where, what those two, what he's referring to? It kind of makes more sense when you hear exactly what he's talking about. Wesley is essentially pointing us back to our text from James, what we just read. James finishes this letter by telling his readers how to care for their own souls. If we go back and look at what we just read. Look at what he says. Are any among you suffering? The response in the Greek is second person plural. You all should pray. Is any singular one among you? He says, all of you should pray. Are any sick among you? Let them call for the leaders of the church to come. Have you sinned, failed, done something wrong? Each of us should confess that to each other and pray for each other that we can be healed. Isn't that interesting? So he's kind of talking about the life of the Christian and he's saying all these things, all these ways forward, are done within what? Community. Ask yourself the question. And I think every week we can kind of answer this during our joys and concerns time. How often do we get sick? I've got one son who I should say we, because Devin is listening and she'll get mad at me if I don't say it's our son. So we have a son who is at home with a cold. How often are we suffering? I mean, think about suffering. In, in the terms of what the apostles would be talking about, it would have been like persecution. But let's look at kind of what our suffering looks like. Have you ever suffered through anxieties? Have you ever suffered Feelings of loss. Well, we've talked about that during our past time, right? Have we suffered through fears? Are we anxious? Have we suffered with disappointments in our lives? Suffered with regrets? Here's a good one for you. How often do we fail one another? If I was to ask you to sit back, I mean, which I'm not going to, but to list out the number of times you failed other people, well, okay, perhaps you've not. But for me, it would fill up a notebook. The number of times when I have failed by saying something I shouldn't have, failed by doing something I shouldn't have, failed by not doing something I, sh I was supposed to have done, failed by not saying something I should have. I have a long history of failing others.
In each instance, James is telling us that the way forward is accomplished with each other. All these issues that we deal with, James is saying, talk to one another, confess to one another, pray for one another. Notice that he says, this, I, this is so good. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And if anyone has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to who? Isn't that interesting? Listen to what James says. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may All of this is done in the context of doing it together as community. So here we are, the end of September of 21, still in the middle of a pandemic. And the pandemic has caused major disruptions in how we do church. And how we do church. Look around you, we all have masks on. Suddenly, it was no longer safe to gather together in the same place of worship. When I started at Springfield, the church was closed. September, October, November, December, January, February, and March. My first seven months at that church were done preaching to an empty room, to a camera. And it wasn't until Easter that we finally opened the doors back up and people came back in. And there were churches that were much later in reopening than we were. And I felt like we were behind. You know, in this very church, you were every other week. One week you were here, the next week you weren't. And then when it was really bad, you weren't here. Churches were forced to close their doors and transition to online services. Now, let's talk a little bit about how we do things. During our joys and concerns, you were able to look up on the screen and see all the people who are online. We can hear the people who are online tell us their prayer requests. They're part of our community. We maintain that feeling of community by how we do our online services. We can still do church together. But as the churches get bigger, some simply just add a live stream to their sites. And what does church become like? Watching TV. You're not part of the community anymore. Before we knew it, we'd forgotten the whole point of why we gathered together. We gather together as a body to encounter Christ through the community of faith. The Methodist Church holds that the gathering of the church, the body, is a means of grace. In other words, God's grace comes to us and is channeled to us when we gather together. When we come together, we, we, we don't know why we want to be here, but we do. And when the doors were closed, we kept saying, how long will it be can we can come back to church? At Springfield, I got the question weekly. When are we reopening? When can we come back? When can we come back? Now, I knew why, but I never bothered to ask anyone. It's like, why do you want to come back so bad? Isn't it easier? Oh, we want to gather. We want to be together. And that's because we encounter Christ when we gather. This is one of the reasons why I love what we do here, because we can interact. We're together. We're part of a community of faith. Our faith is worked out together. Together, we support one another. Together, we encourage one another. Together, we extend God's grace and mercy to one another.
is I stand up here at the pulpit and I hear Karen asking for prayer, giving us a praise report about her mom. She's a part of us, right? She's part of it. And as I'm talking about what happened with Springfield with Jeff Roberts, everyone online is listening in and are praying with us. Here's the real key. Paul tells us, he's the one that comes up with it first. And John will do this in Revelation as well, that the church is the body of Christ. What does that mean? Essentially this. That means that we encounter the presence of Christ through his body. You can't separate Jesus from the body. I think we'd like to think we can, but that's like cutting the head off from the body. Tareth Nordling is a professor of worship studies at Regent College in Vancouver. She recently made this following statement. Faith done apart from the body is faith done apart from Christ. It's like, wow. To see Jesus is to see him with God's people. Can't separate Jesus from the body of Christ. What does all that mean? It basically means this. We need each other to live the Christian life. And this is what John Wesley meant. There is no religion but social and no holiness but social holiness. Silverbrook, this great church. I love this church. I've been at this church for two months now. I love this place. But Silverbrook is more than just a building that was built in 1907. It's a community of faith, a group of people who are the church. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We extend that community, that grace, that presence of Christ to one another as his body. So whether you're here, or whether you're joining us online, we are the community, the body of Christ. We depend on one another. We give God's grace to one another. It comes through us to one another. This is how God has designed faith. Why? I have no idea. I wish I did. But Jesus said, this is my church. I would make disciples. Then they gathered throughout Acts. They grew. God's grace was with them. And you read the first five chapters of Acts and you see just the amazing things that they did together. My friends, learn. Help us to learn together. Live together to depend on one another, to pray for one another, as James has said. Let us be the body of Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we love you today. We are so grateful to you. We're so grateful, Lord, that we don't have to walk this walk by ourselves. But Lord, we have new family members. People who care about us, who we in turn care about. Lord, now help us to never forget to pray for one another to encourage one another, to forgive one another, to embody Christ's reign together in our community, in our city. 
Help us, Lord, to reflect your love to each other and to those who are outside. In Jesus' name, amen. So today I have a great pleasure and privilege to welcome new members into Silverbrook United Methodist. So Phil and Susan, if you would please come down.